بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of God most gracious most merciful and may God's peace be upon all of his prophets starting with the father of the ideology of the oneness of God prophet Abraham and going through all of his prophets prophets from the time of Abraham and the descendants of Abraham including prophets Moses prophet Jesus and the last of all prophets Muhammad may God's peace and prayers be upon them all on behalf of the shareholders of American Finance House, La Riba, the management, the staff, and on behalf of the Muslim community in the United States and Canada, I'd like to welcome all of you here this morning. And I really appreciate you braving the early hours when we start, and we thank you very much for coming. And also those who live in Los Angeles, congratulations on the Lakers. And, uh, would like to also congratulate every father here this morning for Father's Day. And I'm sure tomorrow your wife and children will be taking you out, having a nice Father's Day breakfast or lunch, and I hope you will have some nice gifts tomorrow. The idea of American Finance House La Riba started 14 years ago, and we started with humble means, but we did one thing that's very, very significant and that was relying on the resources of the community, relying on the successes of many members of the community. And our motto was very simple. If you really believe in what you say, you put your money where your mouth is. And that's what many of the Muslim community members have done for the last 14 years. We're very, very thankful to Almighty God for guiding us on the righteous path, for giving us people like you and for giving us the thoughts of serving the community to make a difference in the community regardless of the skin color, ethnicity, language, religious background because we're all from God and indeed we will end up going back to Almighty God. Just a little note on the program. To my knowledge, I consider myself very fortunate to be honored with the presence of many distinguished guest speakers from all over the world and guests from all over the world. I know that if I mention countries, I will forget one, as always is the case. So I would like to, you, to thank you all for coming from faraway places. I just want to go through these flags that you see. And these flags represent the awardees, the people, the brothers and sisters, who made a difference in Islamic banking in the world over the last 25 years. First flag is a flag of India honoring the first awardee, and that is our dear teacher and professor and leader, Professor Najatullah Siddiqui, sitting to my left here. We're very honored to have him with us also today. Second flag is a flag of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and it was given, actually it represents two of the awardees. Uh, Sheikh Saleh Kamel, one of the pioneers in Islamic banking since 26, 27 years ago, and nothing less than the one who really brought Islamic banking to the 21st century, my dear brother, Dr. Saleh Malaika, the chairman of the next session. And the, then the Malaysian flag, and the Malaysian flag honors our dear brother, please stand up, uh, Noor Muhammad Yaqub, he is the brain behind the recovery of Malaysia against all odds, devising some unique ways to recover Malaysia. These ways are being taught now at Harvard, at Yale, at MIT as case studies for the different approach of government thinkers on how to solve a problem that was not solved by the IMF. As a matter of fact, the chairman of the IMF, the new chairman of the IMF, has acknowledged what Malaysia has done. And you are sitting this morning with the real brain behind many of these ideas and policies. Next to this flag is a flag of Turkey. And we're very honored also today to have with us, and it was a surprise for me personally, and that's why we apologize that you're not on the program. His Excellency Professor Sabahitin Zaim, please stand up, Professor Rahit Zaim, also an awardee of uh, La Riba Award. Professor Sabahitin Zaim, uh, he and Professor Ahmed Najjar, 
may God bless his soul, were the pioneers of Islamic banking, and they met with King Faisal, may God's peace be upon his soul, inshallah, rahimahullah, and they started the Islamic Development Bank idea. Uh, Professor Sabah al-Din Zaim comes from Turkey, and Turkey is not a small country. I don't know if you know this or not, but the second largest military establishment after the United States in NATO is Turkey. So it is not a small country, it is an important country for everybody, including us, inshallah. Then the next flag is the flag of Pakistan. And Professor Khurshid Ahmad, one of the designers of Islamic banking in Pakistan and promoter of the ideas, and it's catching on, I understand, in June, end of June, next week, Pakistan is going to make some final decisions regarding Islamic banking there. Unfortunately, he's not with us. The next flag is from England, and actually it represents a man from England. I don't know what your passport says, Iqbal, but Mr. Iqbal Khan, please stand up. Brother Iqbal Khan is another pioneer in Islamic banking, and he's now trying to implement Islamic banking through the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, HSBC, through a subsidiary called Amana Investments, and they are offering different products from New York, and he is moving, uh, already moved to Dubai. I talked to your wife, and I don't know about this move, but she's excited anyway. And then the next flag is the flag of the United States, uh, representing Mahmoud El Gamal. Where is Mahmoud? Who is being honored today. Mahmoud is sitting out there. And the last flag, but not the least, honoring the Canadian brother from Canada, Brother Barvez Nassim, a hardworking servant of the community in Canada over the last 25 plus years. We thank you all for coming, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have come here in love, to learn, to grasp, to communicate, to exchange ideas in a humble and very deliberate way, so we can come back, inshallah, to our homes better because we learned something more. Thank you all for coming. May God bless you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to uh, introduce the chairman of the next session. He's Dr. Saleh Malaika. I also call him Professor Saleh Malaika. Uh, Dr. Saleh used to teach at the University of Petroleum and Minerals in the Iran, Saudi Arabia. And uh, for the last, how many years, Dr. Saleh? With, years. For the last 10 years, he brought the two important investment funds in Al Baraka called Al Tawfiq and Al Amin to the 21st centuries under his guidance and leadership and the leadership of Nasir Din Khan, another speaker, they have brought in some very, very nice products that would serve the community. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Saleh Malaika. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasooli al-ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good morning to you all. Uh, on behalf of uh, American Fina Finance House and uh, La Riba, I'd like to welcome you all this morning. Uh, this is the eighth annual international conference uh, that La Riba Islamic Banking and Finance is holding. And uh, from one year to another, it keeps getting better. Uh, American Finance House La Riba has started with a humble beginning in 1987 and um, has achieved uh, tremendous success not only in profitability, but um, recently we heard about uh, their introduction of uh, home finance, which was sold to Freddie Mac. Uh, and I think that was a very big achievement uh, since it's opening the door uh, for uh, Islamic home finance in the United States in a big way, inshallah. Uh, we have um, a keynote speaker, Professor Najatullah Siddiqui, and then uh, three other speakers this morning. Uh, for the sake of time, we're already late uh, in our beginning. Uh, we're going to limit each speaker to uh, 15 minutes. Uh, Professor Najatullah Siddiqui, which was introduced already by Dr. Yahya Abdul Rahman, is very well known. Uh, he's um, a professor of economics at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And uh, he's done tremendous work in promoting Islamic banking and finance uh, um, 
he, he, uh, his research is very well known, books written on Islamic economics. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, please join me to welcome Professor Najatullah Siddiqui. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, before I say a few words, I, I remember, I think it was 1989, I first knew Dr. Yahya Rahman. And uh, I was a little surprised uh, after the very first meeting how he is putting so much trust in me to honor me as the first awardee, as he said, and other things. But later on, I had occasions to meet him and observe his uh, moving around. And then I discovered the secret that he's a man who trusts you, and therefore you trust him. And that is how he has gathered around him, mashallah, very eminent people, people with brains, people with legs to walk around and do his biddings. I'm thankful to him to give me this occasion. You know, as he said, it's about quarter century or more that modern Islamic banking and finance has been around. And it has moved around along two parallel streams. One, let us call it official, Pakistan, Iran, Sudan, Malaysia, Indonesia, so many countries are doing it on the government level. The other is in the private sector. For reasons which you will not miss, I will focus, I will focus on the private sector. Why? One should give more importance to states, governments, big names. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. First, uh, very elementary but significant reason is that it is in the private sector that most of the money is. It is individuals, companies, corporations who own the money which you want to attract and uh, move around. So no wonder one should pay more attention to individuals, institutions, corporations, and the private sector. The second, no less important reason is that individuals are the people with conscience, Zamir. You see, I mention this because Islamic finance, Islamic banking uh, has two pillars on which to get a solid, uh, solid standing. One is, of course, efficiency. If these, if these institutions don't make profit for you, don't uh, give you home finance at competitive rates, you won't be becoming their customers. But there is the other important reason that they do the things which satisfy your conscience, which is according to teachings in which you believe, according to values to which you subscribe. So that is no less important a reason. And for this reason, I think we should pay more attention to people with conscience rather than to governments. I do not say they have no values, they have no ideals. Uh, they have no conscience, but you know, there is a difference between an individual with a conscience and with a realization that he has to face his Lord one day and a big institution, a cabinet and president and advisors, so the conscience gets diluted or diffused. Uh, the third reason on my advice for focusing on private sector is that at the present, our uh, size is very limited. The volume of money which we are handling are which the individual Islamic financial institutions are able to mobilize is not big enough to meet the need of governments. Uh, governments in developing countries, for example, are in need of um, financing their infrastructure, telecommunications, road system, transport. We don't have that much money. We have some modest amount of money which may be better in the service of individual, for example, uh, needing to buy a house, home. People going into medical practice needing some equipment, x-ray machines, MRI machines, other things. Individuals uh, needing a car and so on. So that is another practical reason that we should pay more attention. And it so happens that most of our recently developed products, uh, our Ijara and Salam and Istisna, they are also 
at the present tailored to meet modest needs, not very big needs which uh, run into hundreds of millions in terms of finance. Lastly, I think uh, as compared to governments, private sector and individuals, institutions, they are more flexible, they are more innovative, they are quicker to adjust to the changing industrial and financial environment around us. And these are days of monumental change. If you stick to the old ways of doing things, you get sidelined. So this is the last but not the least reason. And I think we, if you go back a little to history, it has been the individual, the private sector, which has been in the vanguard of Islamic financial institution since the middle of the 20th century. As a matter of fact, involvement of the state has been a mixed blessing. Nation states tend to use everything, including religion in general and Islamic finance in particular, as instruments of national policy for promoting their strategic interests and hidden, hidden agendas. In case of authoritarian regimes, Islamic finance has often been used as a tool for consolidation of authority and for ensuring political legitimacy. Priorities dictated by economics have sometimes been forsaken in favor of those dictated by political expediency. This happened in Pakistan in the late 70s when Islamization of the liability side was done first while the asset side of the commercial banks was yet to change. Sudan was no different as sweeping legislations were introduced in early 80s without doing the necessary homework for preparing the ground properly. So it is interesting to note that in the early periods of Islamic history, finance was largely left to the individual. The state exercised hisba, that is regulatory functions to ensure fair dealings, preventing fraud and deception, and monitoring weights and measures and other standards. But it did not take over the positive function of managing the community's savings and investment. One of the lessons of recent history has been that governments tend to over-regulate. These are reasons to believe, there are reasons to believe that a modern Islamic state will be overzealous to regulate. It may even overstep from regulation to full-scale management of the financial sector. One can already discern such a tendency in Sudan, Pakistan, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. But neither the law of Islam nor the maqasid al sharia or the masalih involved require such a policy or even condone it. Such policies can only lead to disastrous results, as the history of the socialist states have shown. Moreover, collective management does not and cannot have the flexibility and innovativeness that Islamic finance requires in a fast changing world. The moral, especially for the Islamic financial movement in the West in general and in the United States of America in particular, is that we should focus on the private sector, on individuals at the grassroots. For them especially, not much good will come out of focusing on Muslim countries, coaxing them to adopt Islamic finance, or divert some of their resources toward it by simply issuing a government decree. As you know, Islamic financial movement is before 75, 1975 grew on the basis of dedicated efforts of individual initiatives at the grassroots. The three notable developments in, of interest-free savings and loan societies in Indian subcontinent, which has been documented by Dr. Muhammad Habibullah, that dates back to 40s. The city of Mithramr experience experiment in Egypt, pioneered and documented by late Ahmad Najjar Rahimahullah, and the Tabung Haji in Malaysia, which won Islamic Development Bank Award for its innovative role. All these date back, all the two, both of them date back to 1960s. Now, uh, all of this came about through individual efforts. Even the Dubai Islamic Bank established in 75, Dal Mal Islami, Al Baraka, all these are based on individual initiatives. 
These were, of course, parallel to these. There was the Islamic Development Bank established in 1975, and then we have the government initiatives, 1979 Iran, 83, sorry, 1979 Pakistan, 83 Iran, 84 Sudan. Now, a great blessing had this government initiative, official patronage. Uh, later on, Pakistan, Iran, and Sudan were followed by Malaysia and Malaysia and Indonesia. It has been a great blessing indeed. I am not the one to belittle it. And uh, I think we should thank Allah that they were there. It is because of the government uh, adoption of Islamic finance that it came on the world scene. It, was, it became something visible, something which you cannot ignore, neither the IMF nor the other big players in the world of finance. But Unfortunately, most of these official initiatives lack the solid basis in a democratic polity. The beauty of democratic decision making is that it is not hypocritical. Islamization of banking in the framework of democratic governance would have had the benefit of wide scale participation of those involved, bankers, businessmen, accountants, auditors, and the common man, male and female, as depositors or borrowers. The fact that they had a say in decisions to begin with, and in the decision how to proceed, where to compromise, where to stay firm, etc., would have gone a long way in assuring compliance. Decisions taken in this manner and open to revision through dialogue and debate in the light of experience would have been implemented at least as seriously and as sincerely as the other laws of the land concerned. But what we actually had was entirely different, and the results are there for all to see. Those gathered here today can hardly affect the policies of the rulers. Let us hope and pray that they correct, but we think that uh, we can gain fully focus on those within our reach, the individuals everywhere, savers, investors, bankers. And it is heartening to note that a number of indigenous Islamic financial institutions have emerged in North America over the last decade or so. Though very small, their strength lies in being community-based. Meanwhile, the entry of conventional players into the field and rapid growth of mutual funds have provided a new source of energy. And I think they will grow, I wish, and pray they, that they grow. Now let us lastly consider exactly what needs to be done to bring people around to Islamic banking and finance. In the first instance, we need to reinforce credibility, which has suffered in the recent past, both on account of politicians exploiting the idea for promoting their hidden agendas, and unscrupulous profit seekers preying on people's gullibility and using religion as a tool, Credibility requires visible operation. Within a framework of rules, everyone can know and understand. Islamic finance has to be transparent, open to inspection by anyone and everyone. It should not be perceived to be operating in a framework of rules largely unavailable in writing, understandable only to the select few who can make sense of archaic terminology subject to varying interpretations. It should not be projected as something above the layman's scrutiny, tolerating no dissent, leaving no room for debate, immune to learning by doing, and allowing no flexibility in application. We should never lose sight of the reality that the divine part of modern Islamic finance, though crucial and central, is very small. The rest is man-made, resulting from ishtihad, more than in any other walk of life, mu'amalat, that is worldly transactions in general and finance in particular require continuous interaction between the scholars and practitioners for arriving at laws that really ensure the goals of Sharia in a particular time and place. It was so in the heyday of Islamic jurisprudence. It requires a similar environment today. But that environment does not exist at the present. We have to work for it. And I hope and pray that meetings like this one we are having today are designed to create such a movement. Thank you all.
Our next speaker is Mr. Abdul Hamid Yunus. Uh, he has his career in engineering. Um, he's a member of the Islami Center of South Carolina, uh, South uh, California, I'm sorry. Uh, he's also a co-founder of the Islamic Society of Greater Houston, and he's one of the pioneers of uh, Islamic Lariba financing concepts and rules. Uh, he's going to talk to us uh, about paper money and riba, and we're going to use the podium from now on for the speakers. My talk today is about the biggest fraud in the history of mankind. It is about the hijacking of the global monetary system of gold standard. It is about controlling the global economy and as such controlling the world through the assumed power of paper money, the fiat money. It is about riba and paper money. Uh, money in Islam is known to be gold and silver. Let us look at what is riba and money as understood in the Islamic conception. The Quran condemned and prohibited riba in one of the most terrifying threats from God to the violators. The Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, explained in few sayings the concept of riba. One saying stands out more than others to define most of the scope and kinds and the essence of riba. It says, exchange gold for gold, silver for silver, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, dates for dates, and salt for salt. Similar to similar, hand to hand, he who gives or takes more incurs the riba. The giver and the taker are equal. Should the kinds of the commodities differ, then exchange as you wish, provided that the exchange is hand to hand. It seems that the hadith has defined the following items. Defined six kinds of commodities that were essential and commonly used and utilized in their lives. The six ribawi commodities. Number two, any increase of one side over the other because of difference in the quality would be riba. And this is called riba al-fadl or usury of excess. The Prophet emphasized this concept when a companion brought to him an excellent kind of dates from Khaybar and the Prophet peace be upon him asked, are all the dates of Khaybar of this kind? The man said, no, but we parter one sa' one volume of this date for two volumes of ours. The Prophet said, do not do that, but sell your dates for money and buy these goods, these good dates with the money. Narrated by Bukhari. In another similar hadith, the Prophet said, this kind of partnering is riba. Any increase Number three, any increase of one side over the other because of delay in the time of payment or exchange of the commodities would be riba, and this is called riba nasi'a, the, refer, the deferred usury. The Prophet, peace be upon him, emphasized this concept when he said, indeed, the riba is in nasi'a, in the deference of payment. That's to say because the increase is for the delay of payment. It appears that the Prophet, peace be upon him, defined these six essential commodities to be reference lines, each on its own, that's to say, six yard sticks. Each one may be used to price other commodities except its own. In other words, we cannot price gold by gold or wheat by wheat 
even if the exchange qualities are different. It is obvious from the sayings of the prophet and the rulings of jurists from different schools of thoughts that money in Islam is from gold or silver. Number two, money is the measure, the yardstick that prices other commodities. Also, other essential commodities, human stables such as wheat, barley, are measures and yardsticks. All measures must not be tampered with, like a standard measure. Number three, these measures and yardsticks keep their intrinsic value over the years. One ton of wheat keeps and maintains its intrinsic value as a human stable 100 years ago as it is now. As long as Muslims were using the gold dinar and silver dirham as their money, they continued to avoid riba in their dealings and trades. They prospered, and their economies and their golden dinar were a source of stability for centuries. David Friedman, professor in the law school and economics department at Santa Clara University, in his paper, Gold Paper, or is there a better money? He said about money made of gold, I quote, such international monies have sometimes maintained their weight and fineness for several centuries. Examples would be the Byzantine nomisma or, and the Arabic dinar during the Middle Ages, end the quote. Having said that about very briefly about the concept of riba and money in Islam, let us have a look upon the big game of paper money. When paper money was introduced into the world of economy to replace gold and silver money, the Muslim jurists were faced with a new problem that caused a considerable amount of debate and led to different opinions. The jurist Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman Ali Bassam said in his book, Taysir al Alam fi Sharh Umdit al Ahkam, I quote, he said, recently banknotes were introduced into the market to be as money instead of gold and silver coins. They made for each coin a corresponding piece of paper that carries its name and value, the different opinions of jurists may be summarized as follows. Some jurists said it is absolutely unlawful to deal with paper money because it resembles the selling of debts or receipts of debts on the issuing bank. Some other jurists said we should deal with it as we deal in trade commodities and therefore there is no riba in dealing in them with increase either hand to hand or increase for the deferred payment. Number three, some other jurists said we should deal with it as we deal in gold and silver because the paper money is exchangeable with gold and silver on demand from the issuing bank. All these rulings were based on the premise that the paper money would be backed and covered by gold and silver and would be exchangeable with gold or silver on demand for the amount prescribed on them. Facing the realities of that time and because of the weak situation of the Muslims in the face of other world powers, Muslims had no choice but to accept the change to the new monetary system and as long as paper money was backed and covered with an amount of gold equivalent to the amount prescribed on them, the system continued to work fairly well. That was the start of the big game. But paper money gave the different governments all over the world the freedom to spend more than they take in. This power was exploited and still 
by many governments, especially in times of war or, or expenditure, over expenditure or corruption, by printing more money and flooding the markets with it. The bursting power of money goes down and the governments have to reduce the percentage of gold covering to the paper money. This happened in many countries, including the United States. Congressman Dr. Ron Paul of Texas said in his book, Gold, Peace, and Prosperity, the birth of a new currency, I quote, to finance our revolutionary war, the Continental Congress issued paper money in great quantities. Over a period of about four and a half years, the continental currency fell from a value of one paper dollar per one gold dollar to about 1,000 to one. The phrase not worth a continental records the fate of this paper money. In 1913, the gold cover for Federal Reserve notes was set by the 1913 law to be 40%. In 1945, the gold reserves against Federal Reserve notes was reduced 25%. Dr. Ron Paul continued to say, to continue the inflation fraud, this figure, the 25%, had to be reduced to zero. In 1965, gold reserve system requirements for Federal Reserve deposit liabilities were removed, and on August 15, 1971, President Nixon closed the gold window and refused to redeem overseas dollars for gold. The road to rampant inflation was opened to the delight of bureaucrats, politicians, international bankers, multinational corporations, and some labor leaders. The age of the managed fiat money currency was born. The British Empire was even ahead of the United States in that respect. Britain abandoned the gold standard Uh, in 1931, 40 years before the United States, paper money gave the opportunity to stronger industrial countries to buy their raw materials from weaker developing countries with paper money that may be devalued at any time at the will of the stronger country, which would cause the weaker ones to lose the value of their wealth the same was played within each country where the rich get richer by keeping their wealth in real estate and investments that can benefit from the inflation. And the poor get poorer by losing the bursting power of their wages and salaries that never catch up with inflation. With this game, the paper money uh, of paper money, Muslims got out of the track with the Islamic monetary system as set by the Prophet, peace be upon him. The worldly powers changed the track and the direction of the Muslims while they were asleep. Muslims at large, including their jurists, still debate the minute details of riba, interest, and what is halal and what is haram, while their whole Islamic system and track direction was diverged, diverted and hijacked from them. By this game of fiat paper money, the tremendous power of money was shifted from the hands of the whole world to the hands of few countries, multinational banks and corporations, which controlled the global economy. The need for military occupation of, other, of others became obsolete and was replaced by the economical occupation and control. My conclusion is, no matter what is done nowadays with good intentions of some people to abide with the Islamic monetary system and to avoid riba, Muslims are not escaping the fact 
that they are not in the driver's seat, but they are riders on a train that is taking them away from the pure Islamic system into an area that is polluted with riba. It's dust and vapor. As the Prophet said in one of his hadith, the time certainly will come over people when none will remain who will not devour riba. If not devour it, its vapor will overtake him. Another narrated its dust will overtake him. This has been reported by Ahmad, Abu Dawood, and Ibn Majah. Uh, the only remedy is by going back to the Islamic monetary system of gold and silver standard or by analogy using other tangible commodities such as wheat, oil, corn, or other essential commodities to cover the value of paper money and give it a stable intrinsic value. Many politicians and economists, economists as Dr. Ron Paul, are calling for the return to the gold standard. Of course, there is a lot of opposition from governments, bankers, and multinational corporations, etc., to such a change that will deprive them from the powers they enjoy now. Muslims everywhere should support the movement of going back to the gold standard or equivalent substitute commodity. Thomas Mulligan, Times staff writer in New York, wrote an article in Los Angeles Times on September 22, 1996, titled Gold Bugs. And he introduced it by the following statement. Like a genie in a bottle, the idea waits restlessly for a change to be summoned back to life. Now, a small but ardent band of believers thinks the opportunity may finally be at hand for a return to the gold standard. It is the only shot we have had since 1980, says economic consultant Jude Waniski, an advisor to the Republican vice presidential candidate Jack Kemp, who is one of the gold standard's strongest advocates. Waniski and fellow gold bugs say restoring the link uh, abolished 25 years ago between the dollar and the gold as is a tonic for all our ills in economy and social life. It will banish inflation, cut mortgage rates in half, slash the federal deficit, and spur such a surge in investment and productivity that the American family once again will be able to live on a single income. Thank you very much. May God bless you and uh, keep you in his tender care. Salam. Thank you, Mr. Yunus. Our uh, next speaker is Professor Muhammad Isa. Uh, he's a, a professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Um, he's a Mellon lecturer there, and he's going to talk to us about Orf custom terminology and uh, ishtihad as applied to Islamic banking and finance. Um, uh, I think I stick from here because uh, okay. I have to read from this. If you prefer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah rahman rahim Wa salatu wassalamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala Ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, the people behind this opportunity to uh, give me the honor to be with the uh, people how to know, who, who know how to run the budgets very well and to uh, finance money. And I would ask uh, that God, Allah mahshurni fi zumrat al that God may put me on the day of judgment with the economists. So, I can know from them how to handle my account with God, inshallah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my topic really today is about something 
uh, since I'm not an economist and I uh, uh, would just cause myself harm if I try to use the economist uh, uh, terms, I'm going to talk about urf. An urf is the term used by uh, Sharia scholars to uh, mean custom. But urf as a word comes from a root in Arabic language that has to do with knowledge. Transmitting knowledge, acquiring knowledge, exchanging knowledge. And knowledge is a neutral term that could be for good knowledge and bad knowledge. But when the, the term urf or ma'roof is used in Islam, is used only to deal with good things. So the term as urf is handled in Islam and Islamic jurisprudence to refer only to the good side of exchanging knowledge or the known thing. And the known is to be good. The term urf occurred in Quran in two places. One in Surah Al-Mursalat, Wal-Mursalati Urfa, and in that particular verse, it means the clouds, and clouds brings rain, and rain for the desert dwellers is the sign of goodness. The second time is in the famous verse in Surah Al-A'raf, uh, that خذ العفو وأمر بالعرف وأعرض عن الجاهلين and this was a command a commission from God to his prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam to command and commission him to command عرف and عرف as interpreted by Quranic exegetes or the مفسرون was ref referring only to goodness, good things, abiding to the teachings of God. When the Mufassirun dealt with that, none came close really to the term that was used by jurists to mean custom. They concentrated on the Salat al-Rahim as to be good to your kins and al-Afwa an man dhalamak just to forgive whoever treated you unjustly, and to give generously in charity, even to those who deprived you who did not give you. So the term has evolved through generations to come from what is known from a religious perspective to what's known from a social perspective, and that's the custom. And what is known to be a custom is known to be a good thing, to be adopted by the community that has a sound perspective on life and feel comfortable with whatever they accept as urf. An urf became known as a custom and known a custom of groups of communities within the boundaries of the good abiding community to the teachings of God. The role of Urf as a custom in legislating and ruling the community became increasingly important as history goes. But at the early history of Islamic legislation, it did not make it to be one of the sources of legislation for any uh, uh, student of or researcher of uh, fiqh or sharia, there are four established sources of legislation in Islam. The Quran as the master source, hadith, then ijma' and qiyas, regardless of some variations on recognizing one or the other, but all Jewish consults agree on Quran and Hadith, and then Ijma' and Qiyas are somehow debatable among schools of thought. But Urf did not make it as one of those. Nevertheless, Urf has always been existing in legislation 
whether we notice it and refer to it as urf or not. Because the sunnah itself, the word sunnah, is in its literal meaning, means way of life. And way of life is what you and I accept and the gestures that you and I in a certain community agree upon to be a greeting. And that is urf. So whatever the early community of Muslims were performing, that was known to be urf. So the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, as registered in the hadith books and in the sunnah as a source of Islam is based actually on urf. Because you did not bring to the community a religion that tells them something that's unknown to that community or contradicts with the behavior of the community. But the religion comes to embrace what's good and to shun what is bad. And there were so many customs prevailing in Arabia before Islam. When Islam came, approved the existence of some and refused others which, don't, which are not compatible with the teachings of God. So urf has always been existing even if we don't refer to it as urf. The question later on developed among the uh, uh, Sharia scholars, gradually until the 16th century, when we find that there is an aggressive attempt to include urf as a source of Sharia, of legislation, especially by the Hanafi schools. And they stated in many incidents that urf is to be referred to by judges, by muftis, by any uh, responsible religious authority to accommodate in their rulings. And the urf became very commonly used in courts and the books that have Kutub al-Nawazil or the, 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 and Fatawa uh, are full of urf and the advice was always to anyone who would put himself or a scholar or someone who would take the position of judging between people was that the advice was to consider urf. You don't tell people from a different community what to do on basis of what you do in your own community. And that was built in, in the teachings of, and trainings of judges and scholars of Sharia. Uh, so Urf became very, uh, my goodness, the computer didn't even start. <laughs> That's the Urf. <laughs> so the Urf in this country to its computers. But the question I really want to raise here is not Urf exactly, is whose Urf are we talking about? When we talk about Sharia, we talk about a body of rules, fundamental rules, general concepts. But when we talk about application, we talk about individuals, we talk about small communities, and small communities have different orfs. And when you talk about a small community with a certain orf that's different from another small community, but both are Muslim communities, which one to choose really to control both communities? Do we have to really bend our law and make it hundreds of laws because of hundreds of communities? Or we consider the general view, the general concept, and we abide by the general concept. I here uh, want to uh, just uh, mention an anecdote. In a newly emerging Islamic center in the United States, uh, the women uh, group suggested to the board of directors that they wanted to celebrate Shem and Nassim. And the board of directors, Shem and Nassim is a, word, is a word associated with a special culture, with a special uh, group of people coming from a special geographical a place and it is associated with celebrating spring and the non-Muslim associated with other things and so on and so forth. So the question was uh, presented to the board of directors and I was present and uh, I said the, the word offended me uh, at the beginning. Then I said well what about the concept of orf here? If people celebrate that day 
to gather together as families and do something good and pray and teach their kids and themselves how to be kind to others. Could we just avoid the word Shem and call it celebrating springs in an Islamic context? Islam has so much to say about environment, has so much to say about how graceful uh, uh, the, the, the nature is to us as human beings, and look behind the grace of that nature, who is the creator of that. This is a reminder way, a day to use as a reminder of the blessings of God on us. Can we change the name? But that was the incident that represents Orf in a, in a certain extent. When we talk about who's Orf, Another community, of course, that doesn't know anything about Shamanism would look at this community as Kafir community. They are celebrating days that associated with non-Islamic incidents. And that was not a, a very uh, good practice, really, Professor among Raisa, people. Professor in, in case you're planning to use your computer, you only have two minutes left. I'm not going to use the computer. I'm just talking from my head now. Uh, the Who's Orf? is the question I ask because particularly in this country, the United States, when we have Muslim groups coming from different cultural backgrounds and we try to implement an issue in economic, social, any cultural issue, and we want a religious opinion on that, whose orf are we going to abide by? In one definition of orf, that was used by Imam al-Ghazali, uh, that was referring to the behavior that's accepted by the good-natured person and you feel comfortable with it. And my suggestion here is the person who knows the best about any community is the person that's from that community. So when we want to know the religious opinion on any issue from any community, we better look at people from that community who understand their community much better than anybody coming from outside it. And in order to do that, we have to work hard to train a mujtahid from our own community. And the sources of ijtihad, the instructions of how to create a mujtahid, or what is a mujtahid, who is a mujtahid, including themselves, thorough knowledge of the community for which he issues an ijtihad or opinion after ijtihad. Muslims in the West in general, and in America in particular, are in a dire need to have their own mujtahid, to train and invest. And financial institutions have the responsibility of allocating funds to create their own mujtahids and train them, teach them, expose them to the sources of Islam. They know Islam very well. And they have to be educated also in the social sciences and the humanity issues that pertaining to their own communities as well. And this is the angle that I really take as an application of when we talk about our definitions of Islamic legislative issues, we talk about financial issues, we talk about allocating funds to establish our own think tank of Islamic theology in our own communities so that we have people who know us, who know ourselves very well and know Islam very well and when they come up with an opinion, it's not a borrowed opinion from another orf of another community and I stop here, I did not read my paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our uh, last speaker is Professor Mahmoud Al-Gamal, who is being uh, honored tonight. He's a uh, professor of economics and statistics at uh, Rice University, Houston, Texas. And he's the chair uh, professor for the Islamic economics. Uh, he's going to talk to us uh, about the revival of the roots of Islamic economics and finance. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I will try to cut my talk uh, short to stick within the 15 minutes. And so, 15 minutes from now, Shannon? Okay. Um, 
I, I would like to begin by showing you uh, um, a diagram that somewhat summarizes the mental image most people have of the field of Islamic economics and finance, and then I'll try to dissect it and show you that uh, I believe our understanding is quite wrong. The idea most of us will have is that, of course, we have the Quran and the Sunnah, those are the Nusus, the canonical Islamic texts, and then um, there are the Ijma' uh, and Qiyas, which are sort of at, at the second tier, and then all sorts of other methods that jurists may use, which may be uh, uh, reclassified as forms of Qiyas, or reasoning by analogy, and then this gives us a somewhat fixed uh, body of knowledge that we call Islamic jurisprudence um, that is somewhat certain. And then from that, the assumption is that uh, that body of Islamic jurisprudence has determined once and for all that basically everything that is quote unquote Western finance is uh, un-Islamic by definition almost, and that somehow there is an ideal Islamic form uh, that um, may even be derived directly from those canonical texts or at least from very strong juristic inference that determine that those profit and loss sharing types of contracts, um, forms of silent partnership or full partnership, are the ideal Islamic financial contracts to use, but that uh, jurists for some reasons of their own uh, have decided to permit some short-term alternatives like credit sale financing called murabaha uh, or by Abitham and Ajir, et cetera, uh, lease financing and so on. So that's the image most of us have uh, in this industry when, when we look at it, and that's certainly the image you'll get, um, I'm sure, by listening to various speakers today uh, and other conferences. Um, but I would like to claim, actually, that the writings of Islamic economists have played a, a, a crucial role in deciding what goes in those boxes down there. Um, that those are somewhat novel interpretations, re-readings of the text, so to speak, based on economic thought and um, I dare say that a lot of it is not particularly good economics. Um, the economic thought may come from jurists or it may come from economists who classify themselves as Islamic economists, but it basically read into jurisprudence what's not really there. For instance, a mudaraba, if you, read, if you read writings in Islamic economics, you'd think that somehow you'd open uh, books of hadith and find some hadith on mudaraba or so, find some ayah in the Quran about mudaraba because everybody's talking about it. But the reality is, as um, Ibn Taymiyyah said, for instance, that it's, it's one of those contracts that has absolutely no basis in those canonical texts. Um, and when you see people trying to refer to some verse in the Quran, you know, wadribu fil ard or something, and that, that, that phrase doesn't say anything about Mudaraba as the contract that you have now. It's really just trying to play linguistic games. So I, I would argue that actually all of current Islamic finance uh, and, and the understandings people have that profit and loss sharing is the essence of Islamic finance and that everything that's built on credit or debt is un-Islamic in some way and maybe tolerated only as a short-term solution, that that's a fiction that was created in the middle of the last century and it's a fiction that has no basis in Islamic jurisprudence, certainly in the Islamic canonical texts. Um, so what did the historical Islamic economics do, either written by economists or by jurists? The first thing they did was to determine that the illa, or the instigating factors in certain prohibitions that are there, obviously the prohibition of riba is in the Quran as well as in the hadith. The prohibition of gharar is in the hadith and there are some references people may infer from the Quran. Um, but certainly the instigating factors in what makes certain contracts ribawi, or forbidden based on riba or be, uh, forbidden based on gharar, both the instigating factor from a juristic point of view as well as the hikmah or the wisdom that can be understood from a social point of view um, were recolored by those writings of Islamic economists. Uh, and they influenced jurists, convincing them that those were indeed the instigating factors and objectives behind those prohibitions. And I'm going to give you examples of this in a little while. So for instance, in the case of riba, and I've talked about this in previous conferences. I don't know how many people here have attended my previous talks, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this, but I'll give you a reference. For instance, there is the myth that, um, and uh, the late Dr. Ahmed Najjar, for instance, in many of his writings said this, if the rate of return is fixed and the time period is fixed, that is interest, that is riba. But you look at those permitted contracts, like a lease uh, to purchase or um, um, a credit sale with deferment, etc. they all have fixed rates of return, they all have fixed terms. It is not the forbidden riba. So that's, that's clearly wrong. And if we go back to writings of, of uh, Taqiyad Din al-Subki in, in Takmilat al mishmu in Nawawi, you'll find that this was something people had mentioned in previous centuries, was thoroughly debunked, and, but it got revived in the 20th century and somehow stuck. Um, another one is return without risk. You say you can't deserve a return without risk. 
anybody who's had a first course in economics or finance recognizes that there is credit risk. When you lend somebody with interest, it doesn't mean you're not taking risk. They may be bankrupt. They may not have assets to pay you back. There is risk. So that's not the explanation. The prohibition is still there. I'm not saying we're going to wipe it out. I'm just saying the explanations that were given and the consequences of those explanations uh, are not really well grounded in Islamic thought at all. Uh, exploitation of the poor. Um, of course, exploitation of the poor is still possible. Even if you don't use riba in the forms that jurists recognize, you can still exploit the poor. Uh, again, Taqeddin Subki gives the example. You can always trade in, in camels. Give somebody a camel today, get five in a year. It's a 400% interest rate, but it's not forbidden because camels are not among the ribawi goods and you cannot get there by any, by any reasonable uh, form of reasoning by analogy. Um, just some, some self-promotion. Uh, um, I tried to write some, some uh, papers to uh, give... Uh, to analyze the juristic texts as well as, as uh, provide some economic rationale to try to explain what those prohibitions were. And in my humble opinion to this today, I think that um, the prohibition of riba is really about two things. One is collateralization, sort of linking financial and, and, um, and uh, real activities. And the other is the, the concept of marking to market, that the rate of return on money uh, has to be linked to the particular economic activity that's being financed, and that's why you have different rates of return. Uh, but that, of course, is done also in conventional finance. It's just that Islam has built in financial regulations in this form. And the prohibition of gharar um, is sort of um, uh, trying to avoid some, some types of, of uh, individual uh, irrationality when dealing with risk, that people uh, treat risk ex post and ex ante in two different ways. But anyway, I won't bore you with the technical details. I presented them um, elsewhere, and you can read the papers if you're interested. But the, the worst thing that I believe historical Islamic economics did was to convince jurists that there is a viable, radical Islamic alternative that uh, today you can establish a full economic system that looks nothing like Western uh, financial and economic systems, but that is viable. And um, jurists not being experts in economics um, read those articles and books and, and were convinced that somehow, yes, that system does exist. And so you'll see again from the opinions as I, um, as I go through a case study um, that jurists are thoroughly, thoroughly convinced that those writings in Islamic economics are number one, good economics, and that they prove that there is a radical and viable alternative. And then they insist that that's the alternative we have to use. So the case study I want to give is something that for research I'm doing now. Um, I'm not going to bore you again with the technical details either on the jurisprudence side or on the economic side, but I'll, I'll show you examples of fatwas. And I've chosen only fatwas that are available on the Internet, so you can go on your own and look them up, that show how muddled jurist thinking is and how um, the writings in Islamic economics actually, I believe, were, were the perpetrators of this confusion. Um, the solicited fatwas, um, let, me, let me just mention very quickly, I don't have much time. Bonds have, uh, it's like light has different, you can look at it as particles or, or waves. Uh, money can be looked at, uh, bonds can be looked at as money or they can be looked at as debt. They sort of live two lives, um, especially in the world of fiat money, and I'll, I'll get back to... Uh, uh, to to the, the, the issue that was mentioned earlier about fiat money versus commodity money. But certainly in the world of fiat money, um, uh, there isn't a whole lot of difference between cash and bonds. I mean, think about it. You can either carry, if, if you're going to hold $10,000 for a year, you can, either, um, you can either put it you know, in a pack of $100, $100 bills signed by the Secretary of the Treasury, or you can hold it in a Treasury bill held by a secretary of the treasury that will pay $10,000 at that same point. Two debts on the same entity signed by the same person paying the same amount. And here the only difference is about liquidity. Now there are lots of things that are wrong with, with bonds. It's, it's a form of taxation of the poor and so on because the poor usually can't sort of, what, what money is, is, um, is an indefinite debt uh, that the government basically gets to use any way it wants, uh, whereas um, the bond at least is linked to that money. But I'm not going to get into the details. The important thing is that um, you can see from the solicited fatwas, just by reading the fatwas, you can guess what people ask them about. And you can see that the governments and the, uh, the, um, the uh, banks are very dissatisfied with the way jurists are thinking, and they're trying to find all sorts of tricks. And that's, that's how I'm going to conclude that uh, that's the, um, the big disease in Islamic finance today. So the first thing is jurists always keep using the term money is not a commodity. Money is not a commodity. 
But then, as we heard earlier, they, uh, the consensus opinion now is that it has the same uh, rules as gold and silver, which are commodity monies. By the way, all six commodities mentioned in the hadith uh, of Abu Sa'id al Khudray that was mentioned earlier uh, were used as commodity monies at some point in time or another. Dates, salt, and so on, they were all used as commodity monies at different times. So it's not only gold and silver that can be used as numerators and were used historically as numerators. Especially, for instance, in North Africa, salt was a very popular uh, money because um, they have those salt pillars that you can cut into nice coins that can last for a long time. Anyway. So, so they simultaneously say it's not a commodity while they're commodifying it. And then when they're asked about trading different currencies for one another, they say, no, they're different genera. It's okay, you're not trading debts for debts because a US dollar and a Kuwaiti dinar are sort of like trading gold for silver. You still have to obey the rules of sarf, but it's okay. Uh, so they treat them like different genera, but at the same time, a single government is not allowed to issue two different currencies and then determine the rate of exchange any way they want. That's how the Medici's basically got around the rules of prohibition of riba in the 15th century. Um, so, so simultaneously, again, they allow different countries somehow to issue different genera. It's as if they can create different metals that are now analogous to gold, but one country cannot do it. Of course, if the country gets independent, issues two currencies, somehow, magically, that same money became two different genera, as if commodities are arising out of thin air. Um, the other thing they do is whenever they don't understand something, they, they uh, go back to Sadd al -Dara'a. They say, we're not sure how you're going to use this. You're a banker. We, we're suspicious. We think you want to do riba under another name, and you just want us to approve it. So if we don't understand it, we say it's forbidden. So here are a few interesting fatwas. Uh, you, can, you can tell what's going on. Kuwait Finance House asks, well, can we redeem bonds in a different currency? Of course, there are the Sharia board is known to be one of the strictest. They say, no, you can't do that. Um, here's, here's a place where clearly the jurists are strongly influenced by what Islamic economists are doing. Uh, Rajhi asks, well, how can we, how can we participate in, in, uh, in paying the, um, the fiscal deficit of the Saudi government? And they say, oh, you know, there are all these mudaraba bonds and so on based on profit and loss sharing. Those are things that are created in the Islamic Development Bank, not particularly um, uh, good economics, again. Uh, it's just... Uh, uh, basically populist writing for people who want to believe what's written uh, ex ante. But it, doesn't, it doesn't stand the scrutiny of any careful economic analysis. Uh, they, got, they got away with one. They asked them, well, is platinum the same as gold and silver or is it different? They told them, no, it's different. So there you go. You can have two currencies, one based on gold standard and the other based on a platinum standard. You can do anything you want with those. Uh, if you're, so again, you can go and check all these fatwas if you want. Here, here's another fatwa that's very interesting. I told you that Bonds can be viewed both as money and as debt. They decided that that debt is indeed a loan. So th that's one of the, the problems I said, that they try to always squeeze every, everything into those same chapters that they have in their books of jurisprudence. So they decided that, and I'll just give you a whole slew of those. So positive coupon bonds are loans. Zero coupon bonds are loans. Uh, those are uh, like treasury bills. Uh, bonds that pay on promised prizes like the Malaysian uh, government investment certificates or the um, Egyptian Ahli Bank um, Type C um, uh, investment certificates and so on. He said, no, they are loans that benefit, still forbidden. And then again, they refer to that alternative that they, they're now convinced by those writings in so-called Islamic economics that this is a viable and fundamentally different alternative. We can have these mudaraba bonds. That, that will do the job. And of course, they won't, and I won't bore you with why uh, you can't build um, a fiscal policy with that or a monetary policy. Um, in one of the, the, the most insightful of the contemporary jurists, uh, Rahimahullah, Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa, uh, shortly before passing away, was asked by the Jordanian government about issuing treasury bills. And again, the language is very interesting because he, he thought about it for a long time and said, uh, it cannot really be classified as anything other than a loan. So again, maybe, maybe the economics was not presented to him in the best possible way, but at least he recognizes that there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, and then he goes through saying all other loans, uh, all other bonds have the same uh, loan status. And then, um, as, as with all other contemporary jurists, um, attacks uh, uh, the, the Imam al-Azhar, um, Sheikh al-Azhar, um, as you know, to the point of raising doubts about his knowledge and faith, because he disagreed. He just, you know, he reached a different juristic opinion based on the same evidence. Uh, and again, recommends Musharraq and Mudaraba, and you can see referring to uh, Dr. Omar Chapra's book on just monetary th system. Again, as if somehow that's that's a text that that um, from which you can infer juristic uh, rulings. 
So in my opinion, what has happened now is that economists have borrowed the worst traits of jurists and jurists have borrowed the worst traits of economists. Um, so jurists have adopted the worst traits of economists. Economists, when asked about uh, something, they like to give a quick answer. Knowing that they can always change the answer later, nobody takes them too seriously. Everybody knows that every economist has two hands. Uh, he says, on the one hand and the other hand. Um, the, the analysis we heard earlier from uh, Brother Yunus um, was very similar to, to the, the, the vision of what, what fiat money is in, in Goethe's Faust. I advise you to read it. That this was a diabolical plot to convince the emperor that he can issue paper money on gold that's not even been extracted from the land and how how that uh, allowed the, the emperor um, all sorts of luxuries and so on. But I won't bore you with the details. Uh, the other thing is, again, seeking temporary solutions to permanent problems. When, when the government calls you and Council of Economic Affairs calls you and says, we need to solve this problem, you know it's a permanent problem, but you have to give them a solution right away. And jurists, unfortunately, have been doing this. They are asked, what do we do? And they say, oh, here's what you do, mudaraba bond, whatever. They don't even think about what are the economic consequences does it do the job. On the other hand, economists have adopted the worst traits of jurists. While jurists often, you read that they say that what really matters are the meanings, you know, that it's not the name of the contract that matters, it's the substance. In reality, what the jurists today are doing is precisely looking only at the names. Uh, they, they split hairs over whether or not you can call something murabaha rather than just look at it and say, does it contain riba or not? That's what, that's what I really care about. Let's call it contract number one. It doesn't matter what you call it. But unfortunately, economists got tangled in this. So they have all these different um, uh, constructions that they've been uh, developing um, very much in, in, to, to cater to those jurists who are, who are doing the worst things economists do. And the other thing is absolutism in defining what's Islamic. Money is a new phenomenon. And, and we heard earlier Mr. Yunus talk about paper money. I, I'll have to finish one minute. Um, Money, as we know it today, was really invented in the 20th century. And people talk about paper money as if that's what's new. Um, as of 99, only 8% of the total volume of dollars in the world actually existed in physical form, paper or otherwise, paper, coin, anything. The rest are just blips on somebody's computer chip. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and, and to try to decide that we know for sure what is Islamic and what's not Islamic in that completely new context so quickly is just presumptuous. I'll, let me skip all of this and see what. How about this one? Uh, two more slides. I'll go very quickly. So what, I, what I'm wondering is whether or not we can recognize that everything that's not in a text is probable. All human knowledge is probable, even if the best jurists of the century all agree on it, based on faulty economic analysis by economists and by the jurists themselves. We have to recognize this is probable. It is not certain. We do not know that something is Islamic and something is not Islamic unless there is a, a clear and, and, and unequivocal text about it. Um, we have to overcome the outdated suspicion of everything that's Western. Um, uh, we have to overcome the urgency of always saying, yes, it's Islamic, or no, it's Islamic. Uh, it's not Islamic. Uh, I wish jurists would say, I don't know, every now and then, um, but they don't. Um, and I, I, I would really like that we stop writing apologetic economics papers. You know, and I do that. That's, that's what I do when I, when I put on my hat of Islamic economics. Um, a good economist can write a model to justify anything. I can justify something and justify its opposite because I know how to play with the math. Um, and playing this apologetic game doesn't fool anybody. Um, I think we need to get beyond that and, and, and really get to the, to the heart of the thing. What is the Sharia really about and what really is Islamic and not Islamic? And let me jump to the last slide and say if, if jurists were to adopt the best traits of economists instead of the worst and economists were to adopt the, the, the best traits of jurists instead of the worst, then jurists will become skeptical about their own writings. Even if it's in Ibn Taymiyyah, or if it's in Nawawi, or, or if it's Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, or whoever it is. This was the thinking of somebody during that time. We have better economic research today, and so whatever part of that decision was based on economic reasoning can easily be abrogated because it's human reasoning and replaced by the state-of-the-art knowledge, just like we do in medicine and, and other areas. Uh, you can see the early opinions on, on uh, say, uh, transferring a kidney and the, the more modern opinions as, as jurists uh, got to consult more economists. So that's the second, uh, more physicians. The second point is that when economists have a problem, when Malaysia or, or any country or Indonesia, any country has a problem, what they do is they consult the best in the business. They get the best economists out there to come and try to solve their problem. They say, this is our problem, this is what we want to do. 
according to the state of the art. Unfortunately, we're still trapped in, in, in suspecting everything that's, that's Western, and therefore we have, quite honestly, and I'm in that category, mediocre economists who are going out there and trying to create a system, and we're not using the best talents in the world. Um, so if jurists were listening to the best economists instead of just listening to people who share their rhetoric, their name, and their ideology, that will help them a lot in understanding the real economic situation. And then if, if economists were to adopt the best traits of jurists, they would actually follow what jurists write down rather than what they say, and look at the functions rather than the forms. Stop all this stuff about ijara, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, it's nonsense. Let's just look at what is really the essence of what's forbidden, and let's see if you can build uh, an economic uh, environment where you don't use what's forbidden and use what is allowed. And the other thing is that jurists always, at least, again, in writing, uh, try to look at the overall social and economic costs and benefits rather than look uh, very uh, sort of uh, narrowly. And Professor Siddiqui spoke about this earlier. Uh, people tend to write to champion a certain pol political ideological case and they just you know, you write an apologetic piece in order to say, oh yeah, sure, I can do this with a, 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 an Ijara bond or whatever. Um, but I think, I think we really need to sit down and, and think deeply about the issue. And if we don't publish anything about this for 100 years, so much the better. And if we don't have another Islamic bank for another 100 years, I think so much the better. Let's, when we do it, do it right. Thank you very much. So far what we have listened, all these lectures and talks, and we learned that the whole world economy is built on the foundation of non-Islamic rules. And uh, there is riba and a lot of other things. So now we are trying to raise the pillars of Islamic rules on the, the very same foundation. So th this, uh, you know, I think it is next to impossible. So I want you to emphasize that either we should have to make a new foundation or we have to use some other approach. We cannot mix two things, Islamic and non-Islamic. Thank you. Professor Mahmoud. Um, I, I think what I tried to do is actually to say that that's not certain, that, that um, the economic system is built on, on un-Islamic um, uh, foundations, because I, I don't think it is. Uh, but there are certainly uh, contracts that are being used that are clearly and unequivocally ribawi. I don't think that the economy is built on them, but I think, I think that th there are certain financial transactions that exist now that are forbidden, and, and there are other transactions that are forbidden, just like there is pork being sold in the supermarket where you go to buy your vegetables. Um, it, it doesn't mean that the whole supermarket is built on pork. It just means that that's one of the things that's, that's being sold there. Um, now, mixing Islamic and un-Islamic things, the, the example of the Prophet is, is precisely gradual uh, development of, of, of a, a, an Islamic society and, and what, how to develop it is, is a dynamic process that depends on what succeeded and what didn't succeed and so on. The idea that somebody can sit in, in, in his armchair and write um, a book that says how to build a society from scratch is just ludicrous. Every experiment in human history at, at social engineering has failed miserably. Every such experiment has failed miserably. We're humans, uh, unless somebody, uh, I mean, the Prophet وسلم, was inspired. He, he, it, it wasn't human reasoning that built that society that was, he was in. We are humans, and um, no amount of research is going to give us exactly a perfect system that we can just build from scratch. So we have to start what, by what's there and see what is forbidden and purify our own transactions and try to build the best society we can within our means and then hopefully progress towards something where we feel that there's nothing un-Islamic in our society. But this idea of building something from scratch is, is just not only impractical, it's just uh, n not even a reasonable thing to think ex ante. I have a question for Mr. Uh, Yunus. I'd like to hear a comment on uh, the third world debt because it's increasing at massive amounts and yet the resources that have been extricated from the third world to pay for this debt seem to have been more valuable than this debt. So where are we when it comes to trying to get this third world debt 
eradicated under the present system. I don't see how it is possible, and uh, I would like your comments on this. I think that's why I call the whole uh, system of paper money is a big fraud. It is actually to suck the money of the world into few hands and few banks and few institutions. So it was done for that purpose. So the poorer has to get poorer and the rich has to get richer. That's the whole idea. So that's the reality of the situation. In order to change that, that would be another thing. I don't think you can change it because assume the people who took that power of money, they will fight to death. They will make a world war that kill everyone else to keep that power. Imagine that they have been hijacking that big power and controlling the world now, somehow, and you want to take it from them. On what basis? There are some thinking and some people are thinking of solution. The people who has the natural wealth, for example, they can say, we will not sell our raw materials except by money backed by such and such commodities, like gold. And you will see at that point a big shift in the worldly powers. Worldly powers will change naturally when a group of countries with lots of natural resources will insist on having their products sold only for backed money. In this case, you will find the change of powers in the world. Other than that, it will stay in the status quo like this. I have a question to Professor Mahmoud Jamal. Uh, throughout the lecture, Professor, you have been emphasizing economics as a divine gift to this world, as a divine subject or a prophecy. This is a man-made subject learned from implementation and our practical experiences. And you are challenging the Islamic jurists from your lecture. There is a visibility that you are so burned up from the fiqah and from jurists that you want them to apologize all the time. The fact is that those fiqah and those jurisdiction is based on our faith, the Quran, and the life of Prophet Muhammad. That's a practical demonstration for the entire universe. And that is why I call knowledge. Every action of the Prophet itself carried knowledge and weight. And that's where all the jurist, Islamic jurists, they gather together and they get this information. I don't see any connectivity of your ec economic views to riba or to the, the finances of Islam and its prohibitions. Can you comment, please? Professor Mahmoud. Uh, comment on, on some of the points. Um, obviously, I did not. I, I think you, you, you must have been facetious when you said that I claimed that economics was was divine. Uh, all I tried to say was that fiqh was not divine. Fiqh is is the work of humans who make mistakes and who are corrected over time. It's always been the history of fiqh. Uh, they are not. They do not receive revelation. Um, uh, about uh, the relationship, what I tried to do is to show that uh, the fuqaha can be either coherent or incoherent in their understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, and since I'm not a faqih, I do not try to give the alternative coherent view of fiqh, but I can certainly point to the economic incoherence. Um, it's just like if you're, if you're um, a third grader and you see a faqih that says four plus four equals nine, uh, you can correct him and say, no, that's inconsistent. So that's all I'm saying. Uh, I mean, to, to say something uh, about what, what uh, Brother uh, Yunus was, was saying earlier, I think at, at least I, I have to credit the view of those who want commodity-backed monies and then applying the rules of riba as they exist in traditional jurisprudence with being coherent. It's a coherent worldview. You say, we don't know how to deal with the current money, and therefore we want to go back to something familiar so that the jurists who only know what's in those books can give us the answers. Because certainly in the world we live in now, which they have accepted, 
they are giving incoherent answers. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala shufil anbiya al-mursaleen. The question is again to Professor Mahmoud. Should we follow the path that you recommend? How should we handle issues, Islamic issues, in terms of haram and halal, finance issues in the meantime? Because it might take years and years before Muslims reach an agreement and rethink the issues that you brought up. So that addresses the temporary solutions. I, I, I agree with the temporary solutions. I mean, I, I spoke before that m many of the, of the formulas are already there for, for the daily life uh, issues. So we don't have to, you know, do any, any, anything more. We already have the murabaha and the jara mutahib al-tamlik and musharaka mutanaqis and all that, and that's fine. That's just like going to the, to the supermarket, you see the pork and you say, ah, oh, that's what's forbidden, and next to it is, is the salad or the halal meat or the whatever, and that's what's not forbidden, you buy that and you leave. That's at the retail level. But we're talking about much more important things sometimes, uh, like a, a full, a full uh, Islamizing account. And Pakistan is literally being driven, driven into the dust uh, with an unreasonable view about how they can build an economic system. Um, every now and then, they, the, the, the actions actually don't match the rhetoric. Uh, but those, those are the issues I was discussing. I wasn't discussing the retail level, because I think those are solved problems. We don't need, we don't need anything uh, more than what we already have. Uh, you want to finance a car, you want to finance a home, you want to finance equipment, and so on. The, the menu is there. There are multiple providers of that, and we don't need anything more than that. They, they, they fulfill that job, I think. Uh, the question is, where do we go from here? What's the next step? Um, unfortunately, we don't have um, more time for comments and questions. But let me, let me just uh, make one comment uh, from hearing the... Islamic jurisprudence uh, talk um, in the last few years is that the al-asl fi al-ta'amulat huwa al-hil the basis of transactions is um, permissibility unless it contradicts with the text from the Quran and Sunnah so I guess maybe that can help uh, explain what uh, Dr. Al-Gamal was trying to say um, with that I think we, we come to the end of this session uh, I think we had uh, a very superb uh, performance by all the panelists. And thank you very much for being uh, good listeners and excuses for not taking all the questions.